would like to start by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hani, Dr. Anwar, and the uh, Egyptian Society of Nephrology for giving me this chance to be here in Cairo. Uh, over the course of the next 20 minutes, I'd like to talk. I took the liberty of changing the title to Alternative Kidney Injury. Um, and what we'll try and discuss in the next 20 minutes is something that I think that all of our patients are exposed to um, in one way or the other. Start with some definitions. Standard medicine is the medicine that all of us, physicians and ciliary staff, practice. It's otherwise known as Western medicine, uh, orthodox medicine, or regular medicine. Complementary medicine are treatments that are used alongside with or in lieu of the traditional or standard medicine that we all practice. And this could involve acupuncture, meditation, massage, etc. And then there's traditional and alternative medicine, and this is where we will concentrate on today. These are treatments that are often used completely instead of standard medical care. It includes diet, naturopathy, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, and Oriental medicine. The World Health Organization tells us that traditional medicine is either the mainstay of medical treatment or serves as a complement to it in up to 80% of the world's population, especially in the developing world. Why is it so frequent in the underdeveloped world? For a variety of factors. First, an ignorance of the presence of modern medicine, poverty, inadequate availability and access to healthcare facilities, and long-standing native beliefs and traditions. In Africa, up to 80% of the population depends on traditional medicine for their healthcare needs. In India, 60% of the population depend on local practitioners and healers to provide them with uh, solutions to their health problems. And in China, close to 50% of all pharmaceutical agents are herbal preparations. Now, in the developed world, this is also quite prevalent. This is for a variety of reasons, least of which is the belief that natural is healthier and safer than our modern medicine. These products are readily available and cheap. There's very poor regulation in both marketing and labeling. And there's a mistrust of standard health care by society, which is not surprising, especially when you see very publicized uh, articles uh, scaring the community into being afraid to take their hydrochlorothiazide, worrying that their angiotensin receptor blocker can cause cancer, and worrying that their uric acid lowering agents might make them have a sudden cardiac death. So herbal remedies are known to have adverse effects in multiple organ systems, cardiotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, and neurotoxicity, of course, today is uh, nephrology Society will concentrate on the nephrotoxicity. We'd like to keep in mind that of all medication toxicities in all organ systems, about 7% of these are kidney, are the injured organs. And this is for a variety of reasons why the kidneys are more susceptible, not least of which is that they receive such a high blood flow. So any drug or substance in the system, uh, the kidney will be exposed to it in very large quantities. We have cellular uptake of toxins, the high metabolic rates and workload of our cells lead to low uh, partial oxygen pressures in uh, renal tissue. We have high local drug concentrations in the medullary cells and in the interstitium. And lastly, there's biotransformation of these substances. So we have an increased amount of toxic metabolites and reactive intermediaries. So the data about complementary or alternative medicine nephrotoxicity is really quite limited mostly because we don't ask our patients about these, so we do not elicit a history, and patients don't offer or volunteer information about the non-standard treatments that they're receiving. And then once we do find the history of this, since there's no mandatory reporting, it's underreported. So we have to depend on case reports. And I'd just like to give a few representative examples. Chromium has been offered as a possible remedy for weight loss, lipid lowering, and glucose control. There are case reports of biopsy-proven acute tubular necrosis, one requiring renal replacement therapy, and at least one case report of severe interstitial nephritis that recovered with steroid therapy. Germanium supposedly can treat leukemia and can also treat lung cancer. However, it can also cause acute kidney injury. Uh, and this insult is not completely uh, normalized after treatment or cessation of the offending agent. Cat's claw is an herbal preparation that originates from Peru. It's been used to treat everything from cirrhosis to gonorrhea to female GU malignancies. Biopsy proven AIN has been reported in patients who've been using cat's claw. Chaparral is a leaf that is boiled into a tea. It's used for a variety of different um, uh, uh, needs. Uh, one is to induce abortion, 
It also is supposed to be an anti-inflammatory and has some antibiotic properties. Um, one patient was found to have developed an acquired cystic disease of her kidneys, complicated later on by renal cell carcinoma, uh, due to long, long-standing use of chaparral tea. Ephedra is also known as mahuang. Uh, this has been used for allergic rhinitis, asthma, as a sexual stimulant. After more than a thousand reported deaths, uh, reported adverse events, including deaths, this was removed and banned from markets in the United States in around 2004. However, despite that, it's still available for access for anyone. Uh, it's available in powder, juice, and tablet form. One of the other uh, less common things that we see from Fedra is that it can cause nephrolithiasis, and stones from patients with a heavy stone burden have been analyzed, and traces of ephedrine, norephedrine, and pseudoephedrine have been isolated from their stones. Willow bark is used as an analgesic and anti-inflammatory, and that is because it contains a molecule called salicin, which is converted in vivo to salicin, which is then further changed into salicylate. Uh, which we all know is the precursor to aspirin. Uh, this has been associated with um, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, and also with papillary necrosis. Yohimbine is an extract that is used as a sexual stimulant or an aphrodisiac, and there are case reports of yohimbine-induced lupus and lupus nephritis. Some of these herbal medications can cause seizures. Seizures can cause rhabdo. Rhabdo can cause pigment-induced renal dysfunction. Uh, one example of this is wormwood oil, which has been used to treat Crohn's disease and anorexia and dyspepsia. One young gentleman who was using it to self-treat his Crohn's disease ingested too much, had tonic-clonic seizures, rhabdo, and required hemodialysis and supportive care for some 17 days until he recovered renal function. Many of these substances also have diuretic properties, and we all know that any diuretic would have potential side effects. One example is licorice, which is common in our part of the world. Uh, its uh, root is used as a flavorant, can be made into a drink. Uh, I think everyone here knows Arisus. But it contains glycoretinic acid, and as little as 200 milligrams of this a day for two weeks can cause hypertension, even in normotensive subjects. Uh, it also competes with and reduces expression of renal 11 beta hydroxy de uh, dehydrogenase, steroid dehydrogenase, and hepatic 5 beta reductase. So this can cause an increased level of cortisol, aldosterone, the substance also has a direct affinity for the mineralocorticoid receptor, so we can see hypertension, volume expansion, hypokalemia, and there have been case reports of rhabdo due to hypokalemia from licorice ingestion. St. John's wort is used as a remedy for depression, anxiety, fatigue. In Germany, St. John's wort is used four times more than any SSRI for the treatment of depression. Uh, why is this important for us to know about? Because in addition to some dermatological side effects, St. John's Word is a powerful inducer of the cytochrome P450 family. And so there are case reports of interactions with cyclosporin, and there are case reports of graft dysfunction and rejection in the recipients of solid organ transplants. So in addition to the innate adverse effects of some of these substances, they can also be contaminated. So they can be contaminated with botanicals, uh, microorganisms such as staph, E. coli, pseudomonas, salmonella, shigella, microbial toxins which have been discussed today, pesticides as our colleague also discussed earlier, and toxic metals such as lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic, sometimes in quite significant levels. Those are the contaminants. What's even more sinister is the adulterants, which are undeclared ingredients. In almost all of the supplements on the market, there is a high prevalence of undeclared ingredients. This study uh, from data from the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. Uh, looked as far back as 2007 and in some 300 slimming regimens or slimming formulas, weight loss formulas, they found that 100% of those formulas had undeclared chemical, uh, in some cases, restricted uh, substances. And despite this information being available up until 2016, we still have a large prevalence, as much as 80% of weight loss regimens have uh, undeclared substances. We have a patient that we saw just uh, two years ago, uh, 30 years old, and after having a baby, she wanted to lose weight, so she took AB Slim capsules. She took them for three months, lost 30 kilograms, and was very happy with her weight loss. However, she began to feel fatigued, had a CBC done, and was found to have a hemoglobin of five, 
Subsequent workup revealed that she had severe renal dysfunction, and we evaluated her, found her to have end-stage kidney disease. A kidney biopsy was consistent with severe interstitial fibrosis. She's still on hemodialysis and was suggested to undergo renal replacement therapy, uh, sorry, renal transplantation. What's interesting is that despite this product, which is still available, it is available in Egypt, and it is available in Jordan, and it is available online for anyone to get, and it's a 100% natural weight loss supplement. However, this was removed from the market in 2018 by the Food and Drug Administration after analysis confirmed that it contains subutramine, phenylphthalein, and sildenafil, in addition to other substances. Now, this desire for us to lose weight without hard work has led to some other adverse effects, the most notorious of which is the story of the Chinese herb nephropathy, which is a fascinating story in how the disease was discovered and how its pathogenesis was figured out. And so here, two women in Belgium, ages less than 50, both presented over a short period of time with advanced CKD and eventually required dialysis. And they were both biopsied, and their biopsies showed extensive interstitial fibrosis without any significant glomerular lesion. Uh, luckily, uh, history was obtained from both of these women that they had partaken in a slimming regimen at a local center just months prior to their presenting with renal failure. And so the authors felt that this was far more than could be just coincidence. So they did an epidemiological study. They went back four years and looked at some incident data from their dialysis units in Brussels and identified 624 dialysis patients. And they looked to see how many of them were women under the age of 50, how many of them were fortunate enough to have had biopsies, and they found 14 that had biopsies consistent with interstitial nephritis. They then went and approached these 14 women and asked them, have you been to a slimming center in the time preceding your developing renal failure? Nine of them, nine out of 14 had been to a slimming center. So they went to the slimming center and asked them, what are you doing to these women that are trying to lose weight? And they said, well, we're doing the exact same thing since 1975, but in May of 1990, we changed our formula. We removed a few substances and we added a few substances. They added belladonna, Stefania tetrandra, and magnolia. So what is Stefania tetrandra? This is a root that's used for treating flatulence. It can deal with excess perspiration, and it's also an analgesic, and it has a diuretic effect, which is why it's used in many weight loss um, preparations. And it contains a molecule called tetrandrine, which is a smooth muscle relaxant, which is easily tested for. When formula number two was tested, there was no evidence of tetrandine. So where is tetrandrine and what is there in its place? Well, it turns out that Fen Feng Ji is the Chinese name for S. tetrandra, and the common name is Han Feng Ji, whereas the name for Aristolochia Feng Ji is just Feng Ji. So it appears that inadvertently Aristolochia Feng Ji was uh, uh, substituted for uh, Stefania tetrandra. Aristolochia is a genus with more than 500 plants. Uh, some of them have known medicinal properties that have been utilized by ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans for thousands of years for a variety of medical disorders. But now aristolochic acid is widely recognized as being a potent nephrotoxin, and it's also recognized as being a class 1 carcinogen. So it's not enough that these women have gone on to have end-stage kidney disease. Uh, they also have a 40 to 45 percent chance of having high-grade transitional cell carcinoma, and some authors have gone so far as to propose bilateral prophylactic nephro-urethrectomies. And as of 2008, more than 300 cases have been reported, and I believe now in 2020 there's probably far more, and this is, again, this is an undiagnosed and this is a misdiagnosis. It's, uh, it's underestimated. So why is all of this important? 150 Americans, 150 million, excuse me, Americans use supplements. 80% of them use them on a daily basis. 10% declare using more than five distinct supplements a day. Up to 20 million say they use them completely in place of traditional prescription medications. Only 12% reported telling their physicians about the supplements and preparations that they're taking, mostly because their physicians never bother to ask and when they do ask, they're sometimes afraid to admit to their physicians what they take. The number of supplements and preparations uh, that are available in most markets is skyrocketing day by day. There are now close to 90,000 available in the U.S. alone. And the global dietary supplements market is expected to reach $220 billion next year. And there's 
agents there to treat every ailment you can imagine, from thyroid disease to a person who needs a boost of testosterone. You can clean your liver. You can improve your blood sugars and cardiovascular health. And fortunately for us nephrologists, there's supplements out there that can help prevent kidney disease. Um, kidney cleaners, and this is just one of a hundred different that I found, but it was the clearest picture. And the list of ingredients, there's not one ingredient on this list that any of us would recognize as having any benefit to renal health. Perhaps cranberries reduce the incidence of urinary tract infections, and that's it. And the nice thing about this in particular is that if you buy this supplement, uh, you can get a free handbook on how to take care of your kidneys. If I get a copy, I'll be happy to email it to anyone. These substances are not regulated, neither in the United States nor elsewhere. Most herbal products are considered to be dietary supplements, not drugs. They are not regulated as drugs are, and they are not required to meet the same standards. The only standard that they are required to meet is the Dietary Supplement and Health Education Act, which states that, for example, this bottle of pills for adrenal health needs to be clearly labeled as being a dietary supplement. It can make claims about normalizing, nourishing, optimizing, and supporting, but not treating any disorder. It has to have a label on its back that says supplement facts, the same way that you would find on the back of a box of cereal. It needs to have a serving size, not a dose. And it needs to have a list of ingredients, and we know that this list of ingredients may be inaccurate uh, with weights. And lastly, it has to have the statement that it has not been evaluated by the FDA and it does not diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or health condition, in which case it's safe for anyone to buy off of any shelf. Up to 50,000 adverse events are believed to occur each year in the United States. Most of them are felt to be unreported. The European Union is no better than the United States in this matter. Uh, it's the responsibility of the manufacturer, the importer, or the distributor to make sure that the products that they put on shelves are safe for human consumption. And I believe in our part of the world, regulation is even further behind than the EU and the United States. So in summary, traditional, complementary, and alternative medicines are being used by patients in all regions, irrespective of their education, social, or economic levels. There is only weak or no evidence to support the claims of benefit from these remedies or ingredients. And there is evidence, perhaps not strong evidence, that the potential for harm exists from the use of these remedies. And there is inadequate or no regulation, unfortunately, in some areas for these products. So when we as nephrologists evaluate a patient with renal dysfunction, we need to search for a pattern. Is this acute? Is this chronic? Is this glomerular? Is this systemic? Is this secondary or primary? And we go through a long list of steps. We pride ourselves in being thorough with our history, our physical examination, our lab investigations, imaging studies, and oftentimes a kidney biopsy. And what I would beseech all of you is to now not forget to ask your patients about the use of alternative medicines and supplements. And if they are taking any, I personally recommend them not to. I'd like to leave you all with a short list of uh, some traditional medicines from Jordan that are uh, offered by uh, traditional healers. Um, and I believe every community has their own names for some of the same substances and some of their own myths and beliefs as far as what is good for what. Um, this, is what this is what makes us uh, uh, special as communities. And I thank you all for your time and for your attention.